Today we're going to be asking the question, if aliens came across our music, would they recognise it? Would they understand it? Would they know what it was? Is music universal? And what is music anyway? What distinguishes it from other kinds of sounds? Well, the question of whether aliens would ever come across our music or not isn't entirely hypothetical because there are five spacecraft, even as we speak, that are heading towards the stars. And two of them, Voyager 1 and 2, have got LPs, long playing records, attached to them, like this. They're gold-plated and they're called the Sounds of Earth. And they contain, as well as pictures, by the way, 90 minutes of music from all around the Earth, music by Beethoven, Bach, uh, Chuck Berry, music from India, China, uh, Gamelan Orchestra, all kinds of music that we, even though this is very different music, perhaps to our Western ears, it's still all sounds musical. But if aliens decoded this record and listened to those sounds, would they interpret those sounds as being music? Would they have music of their own? Would we recognize their music for what it was? What is it about music that is musical? And again, is it universal? Well, to begin to answer these questions, we have to go back in time, more than 2,000 years, to ancient Greece. Everyone's heard of Pythagoras because of the theorem we learn about in school that's named after him. He and his followers are said to have been fascinated by numbers and the relationship between numbers and musical notes. There's an apocryphal story about Pythagoras that he regularly used to walk past a blacksmith's shop and the blacksmith would very often use hammers hitting two or more of them at the same time. Pythagoras noticed that sometimes the sounds were harmonious and pleasing, whereas at other times they were discordant. And so he observed the hammers very carefully over several days and realised that if the ratios of the weights of the hammers were simple whole number ratios or very close to them, then that would produce a harmonious sound, whereas if they weren't, it would sound discordant. So. Like most stories surrounding Pythagoras, it's probably just a myth, but it does help us to understand the origins of Pythagorean tuning. Before getting into this tuning system that Pythagoras and his followers developed, it's worth mentioning that they saw a cosmic significance to the link between maths and music. The idea was that the sun, moon and planets each gave off a unique sound, like the note made by plucking a string of a certain length. And just as some notes on a set of strings are harmonious, so the combination of sounds made by the sun, moon and planets gave rise to a beautiful cosmic harmony called the harmony of the spheres. Now let's look a bit more closely at the maths behind Pythagorean tuning. Pythagorean tuning is based on two simple whole number intervals. First one's the octave, a two to one ratio and it's from, say, a middle C to the next C up. And then the other one's a perfect fifth, a 3 to 2 ratio from, say, C to a G. And these form the basis of Pythagorean tuning. As you can see by this chart, you can make all 12 of the semitones starting from any one of them using just octaves and perfect fifths. And there are the ratios here. They're all inevitably involving powers of 2 and 3. Some of them have very large numbers in the ratios, particularly near the end points, which doesn't matter too much because they're very close to simple ratios. But one problem occurs with F sharp to D flat, which is supposed to be a perfect fifth actually sounds slightly off from a perfect fifth. It's slightly different. It's known as a wolf fifth because it sounds discordant like the howling of a wolf. And that's inevitable with Pythagorean tuning, so we need better tuning systems. So Pythagorean tuning is mathematically elegant 
and it's one of the easiest systems of tuning to tune by ear. But it has two main drawbacks. The first is that 12 perfect fifths don't round off exactly to an even octave, so you get the wolf notes that Agnigio mentioned. But more seriously, it can only deal with one key at a time, so that means completely retuning an instrument if you want to modulate or change key. These problems became more obvious as time went on, and as music became more complex, especially when composers started to write for ensembles of players, and eventually whole orchestras. Two other systems were later developed. You can see both of them on this table. The middle row shows equal temperament, and the right row shows just tuning or just intonation. So the main principle behind just intonation is that every ratio should be a small whole number. Of course, there are some that you can't get much smaller, like C to C sharp, the minor second, and C to F sharp, which is known as a tritone. These two will always sound somewhat discordant, you can't simplify them much. But the other notes sound harmonious together. The only problem with this is that it's very hard to modulate keys, because if you modulate, some of the ratios may work out fine, but a lot of them will be subtly different. If you're using the voice, this is fine, but you can't change the tuning on a piano while you're playing, so it's completely unsuitable for that. So, for that reason, in modern times, we generally use equal temperament, which are all powers of the twelfth root of two. So the reason this was used is because it makes twelve semitones equal to one octave. And this makes modulation perfectly simple. You just multiply everything by a certain power of two to the twelfth, and all the ratios are still exactly the same. These ratios aren't exactly whole number ratios, they're all irrational, but they're all very, very close to whole number ratios. Of course, there are other forms of music from around the world that may sound exotic to us because they use different scales or different rules for combining the notes. They might also use microtones, which fall in between the standard notes of the scale. And then there's experimental music, which sometimes tests the limits of what we're prepared to say is musical. For instance, atonal music uses all of the ratios equally, so that minor seconds and tritones can crop up as often as harmonious ratios like fourths and fifths. So back to the question we started with. Would aliens recognize our music? If we heard alien music, would we appreciate it for what it was? We've seen at its heart that music is mathematical, and the sounds that are pleasing to our ears have simple mathematical relationships between them. Those relationships are universal. They're the same everywhere. And so it seems that perhaps music too is universal. Yes. Alien music would be different from ours, just as the Beatles is different from Beethoven and Chinese opera is different from the blues. But would aliens appreciate Beethoven? You bet they would. <laughs>